What's up, kiddos? It's been a little bit too long since we've got to talk about something fun. So I want to talk about my homie, the echinoderm. This one, for example, is a dead sea star. At least he doesn't look very alive, and he's been pretty dried out for pretty long. Now, a lot of times when I used to teach these, uh, teach about these guys in lectures, I'd have three different buckets set up in front of kids. One would have sea stars in it. Another would have sea urchins in it. Another, let's say, had crabs in it. I'd ask the kids to pick which two out of the three tubs they thought was related to each other. Adults often got it wrong, but kids would always pick the sea star and the sea urchin, even though they don't look anything alike. When I'd ask them why, they'd say, because Captain Planet, they both have spiny skin. Well, that's the trick. That's what science is, as we're just big kids saying spiny skin homies too. Because echinoderm, that's exactly what it means. Echino means spiny and derm means skin. So literally, us scientists are calling them the spiny skin homies. The reason why we talk in Latin is because if I called these guys the badonkey flonks, because that's what they look like to me, and I told that to a Japanese scientist, he wouldn't have any idea what a badonkey flonk is, right? Because I just made it up. So there's a certain reason why we like to stick with Latin in our science. Now, there's a couple things you got to have to get me a conoderm club. And one being a pentasymmetry, meaning a symmetry of five is somewhere in their body. Even a sea cucumber, if you were to cut them in half, you would see that there's five muscles just like this star. Or next time you see a sea urchin, maybe pick him up and look at his mouth and you'll notice it's a star shape. It's super, super cool. Another thing that you've got to have are these cute little things called tube feet. Now, if this guy was alive, you'd see them crawling out um, using his feelers. Now, it's kind of like his eyes as well as his legs. It's not like he picks these things up and moves like that. It moves like this across the ocean floor, um, much like a millipede. These are a lot of tiny, tiny legs. I love the name because tube feet, exactly what it looks like. It looks like tubes and it acts like feet but it's a pretty awesome thing with all the nerves in it. This is a simple, simple creature, guys. Yet it's so simple, it's actually pretty complex. Now this little homie of mine doesn't have a brain. He doesn't have a heart. He doesn't have eyes. He doesn't have lungs. He's basically just skin, muscle, and nerve cells. So the cool thing about this is even though he wouldn't feel anything if he were alive and I were to accidentally break a leg off, he wouldn't feel any pain because he doesn't have a brain. Now, not only would his leg grow back, but most species, if you were to get enough of this chunk of the body that has the stomach, it has enough genetics to not only regrow the leg, but the leg that came off will actually grow four more legs and turn into another sea star. So think about that. What is that? That's cloning. Yep, that's where we learned that little trick from. It's the echinoderm homies. Now think about this. If you're an echinoderm, you don't move very far and very fast. Let's say these guys only move a whole square block their entire life. Well, when that happens lifetime after lifetime, basically everybody becomes related. Everybody's cousins because there's not enough genetics to go around, right? So why on earth would a sea star choose to clone? Isn't that the same problem, the repeating of the same genetics over and over and over again? How would that do him any good? Well, think about if old Fred here were to lose his leg, and then that leg drifts outside of the tide, outside of that square block where he ever would have been in his entire life, and then turns into another Fred... Well, then all of a sudden, Fred's got a new girlfriend in a different area code. See where I'm getting with this, kids? They're actually increasing their genetic diversity and their genetic pool by cloning. Now, it wasn't the scientists that figured this out. It was the fishermen. Because that little hole right there that leads to the, leads to the stomach, that was causing our fishermen some problems. These guys love to eat oysters and clams. Now, they'll actually wrap themselves around the oyster clam, and they can only open it up just a little bit. 
So they actually eject their stomach outside of this hole into the clam shell and consumes it. And then the stomach goes back into the sea star's body and he goes and finds his next victim. Well, when old Peter and Paul and Ralph, the fishermen, found that out, and they realized, hey, our oysters and our, our clams aren't doing very good. We need to kill some of these sea stars. Well, they went out and found as many Freds as they could, and they chopped the legs off to kill them. But it blew back in their faces because those sea star became fivefold. For every one they thought they killed, they were actually farming them, not killing them. So it's a great lesson of not to play God when it comes to nature. The only time that you should make decisions like that is when you're trying to fix mistakes. Um, and that's a little bit more of the devil's work, I guess we'd say. But this is some really rad stuff, guys, if you think about this. You know, what we learn to do with cloning humans, we're learning from this guy as well. Now think about it, if he doesn't have a heart, how does he move? Because I'm doing all this motion because of my heart. It's pumping blood through my muscles that's able to make me move around. Well, he's got muscles, but if he doesn't have a heart, then how is he moving? Well, he moves with the salt water around him. He has what's called a madriporite. Let's see where the little guy is. Right there. It's what's called a madriporite. And it's basically a fancy word for a ball valve and it opens and closes and it lets salt water in and out. So let's say if he fell down upside down, he would need a way to flip himself back over. Even though he seems hard, he can bend on his own time. And if you were to sit there and wait about five minutes for a sea star this big, you'd actually watch him in some parts of his bodies, he would release water and make it flex up like an elbow. And then in other parts of his body, he would push more water in and make it bend over like this. So it's an awesome way to move around. Um, you know, a lot of creatures aren't this simple, but a lot of creatures also aren't so darn complex. Um, that's why I really think echinoderms are cool. You know, and what, what purpose do they serve? Well, they're kind of like the possum of the sea. You know, the, our echinoderms and all, like, they're our cleanup crew, guys. Now, in one time, back in the 90s, we had a massive, massive die-off of the Black Rock Sea Urchin in the Florida Keys, mainly due to the Panama Canal and a disease escape from the Pacific. And once it hit our Caribbean cousins, they didn't have the right immunity because the sea urchin, unlike the sea star, he doesn't have that cloning ability. So he's basically just all cousin. Now, when he gets sick, they all get sick. That's when we realize the importance that black rock sea urchin was like the vacuum sweeper of our reef. We watched our reef go from vibrant corals to a film of algae growing all over every piece of coral. And that's when it hit us, what the echinoderm was doing. And that's when we started learning more about them and started protecting them. You know, and some islanders say that that madriporite is a sacred rock. And it's a sacred pebble that every sea star goes and finds. Every sea star has its own sacred rock. And they carry it um, into their death. That's uh, an old man told me that one time. And he wanted to know the truth. I was pretty bummed out when I told him it was a magic porite. <laughs> it's like, man, I wish it was just a magic rock because I like that story better. <laughs> Love you guys. Hope you enjoyed that.